my name is Ollie Jay. Um, um, I'm, I'm an associate professor in the Sydney School of Health Sciences, which is in the Faculty of Medicine and Health at the University of Sydney. Um, I'm the director of the Thermal Ergonomics Laboratory, which is a, a group of researchers, um, which is um, uh, predominantly consists of postdoctoral fellows, uh, PhD students, and we also have some affiliate members from um, other organisations, both within Australia and overseas. Uh, we also have some early and mid-career researchers that are involved with our group as well. I'm also part of the Charles Perkins Centre. Uh, so uh, the CPC is a multidisciplinary institute at the University of Sydney, and I lead up the uh, um, Climate Adaptation and Health Research Node at the CPC as well. So as um, the video that Sophie showed uh, quite um, uh, clearly demonstrates is that um, all of the um, evidence points to the fact that our climate is changing. And this is quite nicely illustrated in this schematic that was published in the New York Times Climate Supplement back in 2015. And what, what this, this schematic does, it compares the data, the, the, the um, temperature data, um, in the more recent decades to uh, a reference point, which is between 1951 and 1980. And then it classifies days or the temperature of those days based on what we would consider cold, normal, hot, or extremely hot during those three decades. If we compare what we saw back in the, in, in, during that uh, period, and we look at what we have seen between 2005 and 2015, the days that used to be considered normal um, are really quite scarce or more scarce. And um, what used to be considered hot is now the new normal. And um, what, is, what used to be considered extremely hot is increasingly uh, a regular occurrence. Now this is between 2005 and 2015. This is for the Northern Hemisphere. It's worth keeping in mind that eight of the 10 hottest, day, hottest years on record in Australia have occurred since the year 2005. And um, four of those five, four of the top five have occurred in the last five years. So um, clearly we're headed on a trajectory. Um, there is some, um, part of that trajectory means that we have to deal with uh, warming moving into the future, at least for the next couple of decades uh, before we can turn this around. So a lot of our, my research focuses on what we can do to cope with the uh, inevitable warming that's going to occur in the next couple of decades. And also what we can do to try to mitigate further change further down the line. So actually, um, just looking back at that schematic, um, the, we do a lot of research in the area of heat and health, um, but what I'm gonna present is a, a stream of research that we're doing that looks at helping people cope with hot weather while mitigating the amount of energy that we need to use and the, the amount of greenhouse gas emissions that are associated with the cooling that we, uh, that we need to cope with that hot weather. And also at the extremely hot end of the spe spectrum, where we see really quite significant um, health effects of extreme heat exposure. So if we look at the, uh, the, the hot range of things there, one thing that we're probably very familiar with is a lot of people use air conditioning as a way of coping with hot weather in general. Um, we know that it's very effective at preventing heat wave related deaths. Um, that's been demonstrated in the published literature um, associated with extreme heat events, particularly in North America. The problem is, is that the cost of AC use is absolutely enormous. So from an economic perspective, there's a thing called time of use pricing, which I'm sure many people are familiar with, which means that air conditioning is most expensive during the hottest part of the day when the people need it the most. From an environmental perspective, we also know that AC use creates an enormous amount of CO2 as a byproduct of the electricity that's used to, um, uh, to power air conditioning. And it leads to this kind of vicious cycle where we have Hot weather, people find a way of coping with hot weather by using air conditioning. Air conditioning uses a lot of electricity. In many parts of the world, particularly in Australia, a lot of that electricity is generated by uh, burning of fossil fuels. Those fossil fuels generate greenhouse gas emissions that then contributes to hotter weather in the future. And it creates this vicious cycle, which we can't really get out of. So we're trying to focus on some adaptation strategies as far as that's concerned. If we move away from the hot weather to the heat extreme, so the extremely hot weather, um, there are, is a phenomenon called heat waves, which I'm sure we're all familiar with. And this is characterized by extended bouts of extreme heat and often humidity as well. And the health impacts of heat extremes are really quite striking. So we know from a mortality point of view, from the, point of, from the perspective of people dying, there was a very uh, high profile heat wave in mainland Europe in 2003, which very conservatively, the very conservative estimate 
thinks it was uh, responsible for at least 70,000 excess deaths over the course of three to four weeks of that particular heat wave. There was a heat wave in, in Russia in 2010 that was resp responsible for at least 56,000 excess deaths. It's not just people dying, it's people becoming sick and the, also the cost associated with the, the healthcare um, cost associated with dealing with that morbidity. Um, as examples, uh, the, the really quite famous heat wave in 1995 in Chicago saw an increase, a 35% increase in the number of people aged over 65 years old that were, uh, that were hospitalized. And the heat wave in, in, in Adelaide in 2009 saw an increase in the number of 75 year olds hospitalized by 150%. So these are quite striking that um, the health impacts are really um, concentrated in um, a, a more vulnerable subsections of society. So this has um, uh, led to a, a numerous papers that have, have done extensive analysis. And um, what we do know is that over the last 20 to 25 years now, that heat waves are actually responsible for more deaths than all other natural disasters combined, which is really quite something if you think about it. And this led to back uh, 20, 10 years ago, for uh, authors in The Lancet, which is a, 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 a um, highly esteemed um, medical journal, which I'm sure many people are familiar with, which declared that the health effects of hot weather are fast becoming the global public health challenge for the 21st century. So um, a key component of my research program at the, uh, the University of Sydney is a climate chamber. So this is really uh, the central point of everything that we do. So within this climate chamber, we can simulate all sorts of different heat extremes or hot weather. Um, this is a picture of the old chamber. We actually have a new one. I'll show you a, a picture on the next slide. The way I, I, I see what we can do with this particular climate chamber is that we see, I see it as something of a time machine. So what we can do is that we can actually revisit heat waves of the past where we simulate the peak temperature and associated humidity in that chamber. and We expose human volunteers to these conditions. We measure their physiological responses. We measure how much, how hot they get, how high their core temperature gets, how dehydrated they become, how much work their heart has to do, which is incredibly important because cardiovascular disease is one of the leading risk um, uh, factors when it comes to mortality and morbidity in extreme heat waves. Um, we also simulate different, simulate different types of heat waves because the, the, as I'll demonstrate further on in my presentation, is that the solution that we present is going to be quite different depending on the type of heat wave if, we're not, if we look at pivoting away from the use of air conditioning. Another thing that we can do is that we can work with climate scientists, which is what we do, and we try to predict what the heat waves of the future are going to look like following different carbon emission pathways. So if we stay with the business as usual pathway, which is the RCP 8.5, we know that point by 2070 or by 2100, certain types of heat waves will occur. And we can simulate those heat waves and we can actually assess how, what impact that will have on human health and well-being of our human volunteers and their capacity to do different types of occupational activities. Another key component of the work that we do is actually in the occupational space where we simulate different work environments. So for example, we did a study recently looking at sustainable cooling strategies that are appropriate for um, a Vietnam, Vietnamese uh, work, work environment. We also have a Welcome Trust grant where we're looking at the same solutions for, for uh, people in Bangladesh. So as I mentioned, we actually um, have a brand new building that's been built on the main campus of the University of Sydney, which is named after Susan Wakehill, who's a major contributor to it. And on the ninth floor of that uh, new building, we have a brand new climate chamber, which is going to enable us to do things that we just haven't been able to do before. It's going to have the capacity to simulate extreme heat events from a temperature, humidity. We can simulate different types of solar radiation and also different types of wind as well. Uh, we're also um, currently looking at um, doing the same thing, but simulating bushfire uh, pollution exposure and looking at the interactions between that and extreme heat. So just to give you an overview of what we do, we look at the way in which extreme heat and hot weather impacts human health and well-being across the human lifespan. We look at how it affects pregnant women, um, how, uh, how it affects uh, neonates and, uh, and, and newborns, and how that might modify the way in which we might manage their body temperatures. We have a large NHMRC project grant, which is looking at developing a, the, the first evidence-based extreme heat policy for child and youth sport. When we get to adulthood, we work with extreme, uh, with, sorry, uh, with elite athletes. So I've developed the extreme heat policy for the Australian Open tennis tournament, for example. We work with disabled athletes as well as recreational athletes. I mentioned we do work in the occupational heat stress um, um, uh, realm. 
We also do work looking at the way in which heat exacerbates um, conditions such as multiple sclerosis. We have uh, support from MS Research Australia for that. We also try to better understand the way the me underlying mechanisms for hot flashes during menopause and try to come up with um, evidence-based strategies trying to mitigate the negative effects of those hot flashes. And what I'll touch on today probably uh, mostly is the way in which age-related decrements in our ability to manage body temperature physiologically really elevates the risk of these particular individuals and trying to come up with sustainable solutions that enable the most, most, um, uh, um, the most vulnerable to extreme heat navigate their way through heat extremes in a way that's sustainable and, 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 and accessible. We're very fortunate to receive funding from a range of different uh, funding agencies and external organizations, and I'll touch on some of that work later. So um, based on what I just showed you, we do an awful lot of work in a lot of different, um, uh, uh, from a lot of different perspectives across the human lifespan. But the one thing I'm gonna focus on today is the notion of sustainability and sustainable cooling. And a big part of this work is looking at the process of convection. So this notion that you can move air more and chill it less, and the impact that will have on our electricity bill, on the greenhouse gas emissions that we emit as a function of the amount of chilling that we use, and how this can be effective as a, as a cooling strategy for the most vulnerable as well. So this is really kind of looking at the solution with respect to the idea of using the humble electric fan. This could be a pedestal fan or it could be a ceiling fan, and moving air more. And the reason that this is very attractive is that it's accessible, it's sustainable, and it's affordable for many of the most vulnerable during heat extremes. If we compare the electricity consumption of electric fans compared to central air conditioning or window air conditioning, it clearly pales in comparison. And also it's a lot more affordable as well for those who can't afford air conditioning, which are among the most vulnerable, particularly in Australia. So I'll start off by uh, showing you some preliminary data from a study that we're just having a review at Nature Sustainability right now. And really what this demonstrates is the way in which we can move air more, chill it less, and reduce the greenhouse gas emissions associated with the amount of air conditioning use that we need. So if we look at the typical profile of a hot day throughout a particular day, what we know is that air temperature will rise during the early part of the day, it will remain elevated throughout the afternoon and then cool down in the evening. And what we know is that the primary driver for air conditioning use in most cases is thermal discomfort. So when air temperature exceeds a given threshold, what people do is they turn their air conditioning on to maintain their thermal comfort. But what we know is that that will require a certain volume of chilling throughout um, a particular day. What we know is that if we move the air more, it will elevate that, th that, th that temperature threshold for thermal comfort, and it will result in a much smaller amount of a volume of, of chilling that we need from an air conditioning unit. So it's a very simple kind of solution. We're elevating that thermal comfort threshold by moving it a little bit more and it results in a, a quite a drastic reduction in the amount of um, chilling that we need from our air conditioning unit. If we, so we did an analysis using Australia as a, case, uh, as a, as a proof, of, proof of concept study using the data from 20, 2010, which is a, a moderately warm year, but nothing extraordinary compared to the type of years that we've experienced in the last five years, in, in, certainly. And what we show is that by moving the air at different speeds, we can have a drastic reduction on the amount of greenhouse gas emissions associated with the use of air conditioning, keeping in mind that air conditioning use contributes to Australia's status, uh, un 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 unenviable status as one of the top polluters per capita in the world. So compared to using keeping still air, which is what we do right now with air conditioning, by moving it a little bit, just at very low air speeds, what we find is a drastic reduction in those greenhouse gas emissions. And what we find is that when we move the air around about 0.8 meters per second, which is around about the moderate setting on a pedestal fan, this will result in an annual reduction in greenhouse gas emissions associated with AC use of up to 72%. So this is assuming that everybody does it in all households across Australia. Now, we took into account the number of people that would be at home, the time of, the time of year, the, time, the, the day of the week, so whether people will be actually at home. And uh, we tried to um, uh, do quite a comprehensive analysis. This demonstrates really the uh, possibility of what we can do with moving air um, uh, more and uh, enable us to chill it, chill it far less. So that's when we're looking at using sustainable cooling from the perspective of hot weather, but not necessarily heat extremes. Oh, one thing I should um, add as well. Um, this is the global greenhouse gas emission 
uh, a, ga a gas abatement cost curve. So this is something that um, in the sustainability literature is really quite substantial. So what it basically demonstrates is the relative cost of introducing an intervention to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. Now, according to this, um, this abatement cost curve, the cheapest thing that we can do or the easiest thing we can do is change our lighting from incandescent light bulbs to LEDs. Now, I should fully recognize that um, I'm not a sustainability expert. This is why I work with Manfred Lenson and Aranima Malik, who are co-authors co on the study, uh, because they bring this, this, um, this expertise to the table. But um, the cheapest thing that we can do, or the easiest thing we can do, is switching our lighting, which is obviously being very widespread. But according to this abatement cost curve, and in fact, the use of electric fans to supplement air conditioning, to consequently use it less, is actually a cheaper solution even still. So this is very, um, very persuasive from a sustainability perspective. The other thing I'm gonna now talk about is the way in which we can move air as a way of enabling people to um, keep cool during heat extremes, so during these hottest times of the year. Now this, a lot of people say to me, well, of course you should use electric fans during heat waves, why wouldn't you? Well, the reason that you wouldn't is because nearly all of the major public health organizations throughout the world tell us to turn fans off during heat waves. There's the Center of Disease Control in the United States tell us to turn fans off above 32 degrees Celsius, or they tell us they're not protective, which is a little different. The World Health Organization instructs us to turn fans off when air temperature exceeds 35 degrees Celsius. The US, uh, the US Environmental Protection Agency tells us something similar. This is a quote from the Director of Environmental Hazards and Health Effects Program at the CDC in 2010. And what uh, Dr. McGeehan did was draw a parallel between the use of a fan and that of, a, of moving air in a convective oven. And it basically says that by blowing hot air on a person, it actually heats them up rather than cools them. Hence the CDC guidance to turn fans off when it gets them above 32 to 35 degrees Celsius. This recommendation has actually made its way into the popular media. This is a typical smutty headline from the Sun newspaper in the UK, which warns heat struck Brits that they should turn their fans off when air temperature exceeds 35 degrees Celsius. So the trouble is with all of this guidance is that if we take a look at the literature, there's actually no scientific evidence to be basing this guidance on. And it's really quite concerning given how sustainable and easy and accessible using things like electric fans would be to the most vulnerable during heat waves. So given that there was no scientific evidence to support this guidance, what we want to do is actually develop some new scientific evidence to support or refute the use of electric fans during heat waves. So this is uh, the first study that we did, and this was the first evaluation of fans in simulated heat wave conditions in human participants. This was published in Journal American Medical Association back in 2015. And basically what this demonstrates, and I won't uh, um, uh, spend too much time on these graphs, but basically what it demonstrates is that fan use is protective. It enables people to tolerate higher humidities at air temperatures that exceed the WHO fan limit of 35 degrees Celsius. We tested fans and, uh, with, sorry, human participants cooling with and without fans at 36 degrees Celsius and 42 degrees Celsius. And what we find is that fan use is actually protective at air temperatures far exceeding that World Health Organization limit for fan use. Even at 42 degrees Celsius, which is seven degrees Celsius above that limit, we found that fans were still protect, protective in terms of how hot people got and how much work their heart had to do. In fact, what we found is that our participants were cooler and more comfortable at 42 degrees Celsius with a fan than they were at 36 degrees Celsius without a fan, which really kind of um, demonstrates how um, poorly conceptualized that current limit by the World Health Organization is. Those were young, healthy participants. We did a follow-up study with my colleagues in the University of Texas Southwestern in Dallas and uh, we recruited older individuals and exposed them to very extreme temperatures, so 42 degrees Celsius with high humidity. And under these conditions, we actually find that the efficacy of fan use starts to diminish. The reason for that is that we know that there are age-related decrements in the ability to sweat. So as we become progressively older, our ability to sweat goes down and the benefit of a fan is dependent on the ability to secrete sweat because it helps that extra sweat evaporate in the it's an evaporation that is really quite a powerful way of keeping cool. So what we found is that actually in these older adults is that at 42 degrees Celsius and at these high humidities, 
a fan actually caused them to be hotter, slightly hotter, and it caused them to, for their heart to do more work. There are clearly limits to the efficacy of fans. So there is some truth to the WHO concern for fans. You can't use them at any temperature in any humidity, but it's just that they're really greatly underestimating what that limit is. This is a study that was published in Annals of Internal Medicine last year. And what we did is that we simulated very hot, dry heat waves, which were associated with the extreme heat events that were experienced in India and in Southern Europe in 2018. We also did another trial where we simulated hot and humid conditions. So not as hot, but the humidity was much higher. And this was more associated with the heat waves of Chicago in 95 or in China in 2017. Now, what we showed is that depending on the type of heat wave that we see, the efficacy of fan use is very, very different. We find that in very hot, dry heat waves, fans do actually make things worse. They make you hotter and they make you make your heart have to do more work and they accelerate dehydration. But in the hot, humid heat wave conditions at 40 degrees Celsius and 50% humidity, we find that fans do indeed keep you cooler and they reduce the amount of work that the heart has to do. So this is obviously something that we should be recommending um, even to the most vulnerable uh, during hot and humid heat waves, even at the expense of slightly greater rate of dehydration, but this is the equivalent of drinking an extra glass of water every hour. So this is quite a lot of data. So um, uh, what I wanted to do is translate this into recommendations or what we should be telling people to do in different parts of the world, depending on the prevailing environmental conditions that occur. So this is what I've, I've um, uh, summarized in this particular slide here. This is for a study that we did for the United States. So on the right hand side, what we've done is that we've plotted the threshold at which fans exert a heating effect as opposed to a cooling effect. And we can see that that the critical temperature gets lower, the drier that it gets. And then it kind of takes this, this, um, this, 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 this curve, curvilinear uh, relationship between ambient temperature and the humidity that we see in the air. And what we've got here are the peak heat wave conditions of 105 cities across the United States. We see that the majority of them fall below the curve, which means that fan use, even on the hottest, most humid uh, condition on that particular, throughout the last 20 years, actually fans would still be beneficial. So we use this information to then make recommendations for whether fans should be or should not be used in different uh, regions across the United States. And we can see there's a great deal of green there, which means that irrespective of, um, of the heat wave um, that's, uh, that's occurring in those particular regions, the historical data demonstrates that at least for now, fans would be beneficial. And this is quite notable, particularly for the Eastern seaboard of the United States, because currently, um, the um, health authorities in New York City, again, urge people to turn fans off um, and resort to more uh, unsustainable cooling strategies such as air conditioning when the air temperature exceeds 35 degrees Celsius. We've translated this information onto a global scale now. This is a study that's under review in Lancet Planetary Health, which demonstrates that in places across a great deal of, um, of Europe and in Asia and North America and South America, we see that um, fans should be recommended even for older individuals nearly all of the time. So what this really emphasizes is that a sustainable, easy, accessible cooling strategy can be effective for a great deal of people in many regions across the world. And if we think about what a difference that would make to the um, survivability of a lot of people in those regions that can't afford or have access to air conditioning, and also to the capacity of younger and healthy people to actually turn that air conditioning unit off, use a more sustainable strategy, and the effect that that will ultimately have on, um, on greenhouse gas emissions. So what we've done now is being able to try to stop making some headway into some of these silly headlines that have been made without any evidence. So now we're transforming this type of headline into this type of headline, which is quite convincing and quite satisfying. And um, we're working with the Global Heat and Health Information Network, which is a global network which enables us to disseminate this information among policymakers uh, globally. Uh, we're also working on a, uh, a series, so I'm co-leading with Chris Ebby, who's a professor at the University of Washington in the United States, um, the first ever um, Lancet series on heat and health that will be coming out later this year. I'll be happy to share that with anybody who's, 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 who has any interest. We're also working with local government officials to try to um, uh, provide evidence-based recommendations in the way in which people could keep cool in different regions in New South Wales throughout the summer. 
So uh, there are prevailing um, environmental conditions that would preclude the use of fans because it's too hot and too dry, but we've also done work that develops more sustainable cooling strategies that don't require air conditioning and trying to get that information across as well. And finally, one thing I'd just like to highlight is that we have an ongoing study, which is a very large scale, scale study that's enabling us to extend the findings that are presented today um, to older adults with coronary artery disease, with hypertension and trying to develop a better understanding of the way in which different prescription medications that people take for various uh, conditions influence the decisions that we should be making in terms of how we can keep cool in a sustainable way during heat extremes. This is, we're very fortunate to receive funding from the National Health and Medical Research Council for this particular project. It's a collaborative study that's been conducted in association with my colleagues at the Montreal Heart Institute, UT Southwestern in the United States, and also University of Adelaide down in South Australia. And for anybody who may be interested, these are the details of the, um, of the study. We're, we're recruiting right now. So if anybody um, uh, is interested in either participating themselves or, um, or sharing information uh, with potential participants, we'll be very happy to hear from you. So I'll finish there and uh, I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you for watching. Please subscribe to our CCL channel by hitting the button in the top left hand corner of this screen. Spread the word of CCL by using the share icon to as many of your contacts as possible. Thank you. See you next video.